put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Let the oil of gladness flow down from your throne. Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I your joy my strength alone, my strength alone. Good morning. Let's lift up the Lord this morning. Let's put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We'll put on the garments of praise for the spirit garments of praise and put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness I let the oil of gladness flow down from your throne put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness to dance again with this dry and thirsty land with a river Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful to be together today as your body, the body of Christ. Father, we thank you that where two or three are gathered together, you are in the midst. And so, Father, we are thankful that you are here with us today. We are thankful that you recognize our weakness. We're thankful that you see our hurts, our pains our anxieties, our troubles. And we know that, Lord, only you can breathe life back into old bones. 
And so, Lord, just renew us, refresh us, help us to hear your voice, help us to have that desire to just seek your face. And, Father, we ask that you would do something uniquely special in each one of our hearts today. Our eyes are fixed on you. Lord, we are waiting for your garland of grace as we praise your name. We lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. For those of you who do not know, my name is Pastor Laban. I'm the youth pastor here. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers in in the room and watching online. Uh, It's always... It's always a little weird not to be with your father on Father's Day. And uh, so I I think about my dad today, and I I just have, you know, all all these fond memories of of him as being my dad. And and, uh, so where my dad's at right now, he's probably getting ready to preach. But uh, happy Father's Day, Dad. Um, And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon, which will be on his birthday, because his birthday is so close to Father's Day, you know, which, which just, it doubles up, and, and it makes it more difficult. Does anybody have a birthday on or near Father's Day? Any, any dads? No? Well, my dad, my dad did, and, and so you, you always had that, you know, thing, like, do you get him two gifts? Do you get him one gift, one big gift? You never know what to do, but I'm so thankful for him in my life and the, the godly example he set in my life, and I know that We have uh, fathers in the room and and spiritual fathers, and uh, we're thankful for you. And so, happy Father's Day. Um, We have a little, I don't really have anything to announce out of the blue. You can check your weekly planner. There's a lot going on um, throughout the church this week, and and so make sure you're well informed. Uh, Your weekly planner can let you know of all the ins and outs, Uh, but I'm going to invite our CE directors up because they have a special announcement and a presentation as well. And uh, they dress the part today. So uh, (laughs) there we go. Thanks, Laban. We have a special guest coming out that door in just a minute. But I want to say good morning to and happy Father's Day. For those of you who do not know, I'm Kara, this is Jen back here, and this is our shark friend who we're going to vote on his name at VBS. (laughs) VBS this year is called Making Waves, and we are going to make ripples and change the world by making big waves. So come on down, sign up today. Uh, We're doing ages four four years old through fifth grade, and it's going to be July 11th through the 15th, and we're going to do an evening program this year. It's six to eight. We're still looking for volunteers, so if anybody wants to come out and help us, that'd be awesome. You guys can sign up for volunteers at the table, and also we're starting signing up for children today. So please, please come and sign up. You can sign up your grandkids, sign up your neighbors, sign up anybody you want to. It'd be great to have as many kids as we can have this year so we can tell them about Jesus. Can can you do a little dance for us, Sharky? (laughs) We're going to have a lot of fun. All right, well, we um, we have a Father's Day presentation with our kids. Watch those cords, shark. We had a lot of fun a couple days ago when that suit came. Natalie was here with me, and my goodness, I have videos. All right, can you kiddos come up here and bring your gifts with you? And I'm going to give this to Jen. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. All right, so we worked with the kids over the past few weeks, and they all have gifts for their dads. And for those that were here last week, we also asked them some questions about their dads so we could learn a little bit more about them. So we're going to share those this morning. Okay, first we have Miss Briella. 
My dad's name is Dad. One thing my dad says a lot is, we can go to Duncan. <laughs> I love my dad because we love him so much. Next we have Megan Wagner. Go ahead and take your kids to your dad. One thing my dad says a lot is stop chewing with your mouth open at my brother. <laughs> I love my dad because he's kind. Next we have Sarah. Sarah says my dad's favorite food is grilled cheese. Sarah says I love my dad because I love him. Next, we have Brooklyn. Brooklyn says, one thing my dad says a lot is go to the living room. <laughs> I love my dad because he loves me. Next, we have RJ. RJ says, my dad's favorite thing to do is sleep. <laughs> my dad's favorite food is French fries. All right, next we have Nathan. And the rest of you guys can all go take your gifts to your dads, okay? Go ahead, take your gifts, everybody. Nathan has a little bit of a theme, I think, in his paper. He says, my dad's favorite thing to do is making hamburgers. My dad's favorite food is hamburgers. One thing my dad says a lot is, we're going to eat hamburgers today. I love my dad because he plays games with me. Anybody want to guess what we're having for lunch today? <laughs> it's true. Stand together. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna.
again.
that to be our prayer today, that you would breathe new life, that you would renew our minds, that you would give us strength to rise up in your strength to be the people that you call us to be, that we would stand above the noise and the direction that sometimes those around us are, are heading in, and Father, just allow us to be your instruments that your spirit would be poured out into us and through us, that we would bring refreshment to a dry and thirsty land. Lord, as we listen to your word, renew our minds. And Father, do a new work among us. Cause us to rise up for your glory because you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm just going to ask you some questions about your dad. I'm a dad, too, so. Yeah, I know, because you're a girl and you're a boy. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Action! What is your dad like? He's funny. He's really funny. He's really funny. How is he funny? His dad jokes. You like his dad jokes? No. What are some funny things that your dad does? He claps really hard and... It and mom doesn't like it. He claps really loud. Yeah, like this. Wow. Wow. What is your dad good at? Working. He's really good at fixing things and building things. He usually goes to a fast food place to get his breakfast. What do you normally eat? Uh, biscuits and waffles. It's a lot of carbs. Is there stuff that he's not very good at? Not very good at wrestling, yes. Three against one. Yes. Yeah. He's not that good at hair. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Oh, I thought you were about to say, was that a song you were singing? Um, no. Oh. What's something he's done you're like, Dad is not very good at that? Jokes. Jokes. <laughs> is your dad a pretty strong dude? Yeah. Because he always goes to CrossFit every day. So he's a CrossFit dad. He's like, explode! Wah! Does he do he's that? Like, uh. You do an impersonation of your dad. <sighs> I'm just going to rest my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that your dad has taught you? Nope. What is, it, what is he teaching? Sight words. Sight words. I copy him to do what he does. It. Yeah, you copy him. I just do stuff to make myself learn from him. What's your favorite thing to do with your dad? 
snuggle on top of stuffed animals, go fishing, play and wrestle with me. When you get on his back, you like yank the top of him. How does your dad make you feel special? Happy. He makes me hungry for his delicious food. To make sure you're safe. He makes me happy. Yeah, that's what he makes me feel like. Good job, bro. Okay. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. And one thing that wasn't mentioned earlier was that there are donuts for dad out there in the lobby. Uh, so I just want you to be aware of that. You can't leave right now for that, but you can go after the service and be a part of that. Um, I want to believe this or not, go back to Luke chapter 15. If you would, in your Bibles, look up Luke chapter 15. I know that I've spent a lot of time here, and it just keeps speaking to me in different ways. And I thought for Father's Day, I uh, wasn't planning on this until last night. Uh, this kind of came, I uh, thought it would be appropriate to share uh, this. <clears throat> While you're looking that up, I have a few dad jokes to, I'm just kidding, I, I don't, I won't do that to you. And if you go to the end, uh, say somewhere around verse 28, so Luke chapter 15, verse 8, and then for Sue, I'm actually going to start, skip number one, and I'm going to start on number two when we get to that point, uh, just to let you know. But if you remember, we've been talking about Luke chapter 15. We didn't last week, but for three or four weeks before that, we did. And it starts out with the parable of the lost sheep and how excited everybody was. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So there's the story of someone, something that was lost and was found. And then you go to the parable of the lost coin, which is actually in verse 8. And then again, in the middle of verse 9, it says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So you see this theme in Luke chapter 15 that's, that's carrying on here. And then if you go to the end of it, say around, I believe I said, verse 28. Let me read this uh, part before we get into verse 28. It says, the parable of the lost son actually tells of two sons. One irresponsible, the other hardworking. One wastes his life and comes home humbled. The other proudly refuses to celebrate his brother's homecoming, so there's some jealousy, some pride, some frustration there over what's happening for his brother who squandered away everything but now is being celebrated. And the story ends with one son in a joyful family celebration and a brother outside bitterly unwilling to forgive which son is really lost. So which son is lost? The one that has come back? Obviously not. Or the one who is jealous and bitter? So are we all, are we all, are we, are we, are we in the same groove here? Are we all on the same point caught up to what we're talking about here, which is something that was lost, a person that was lost, but now is found. So if you pick up in verse 28, it says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, verse 29. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. So he's killing the, 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 the calf, the fat calf, for the son that did everything wrong but has admitted it and came back. We're in Luke 15, verse 30. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Little jealous there. 
Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. So just track with me here and in, in, in here, verse 31 and verse 32, when his father is put in an impossible, impossible place, kind of between his two sons and trying to determine the best outcome. I'll repeat verse 31 again in chapter, Chapter 15 of Luke. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. A wonderful answer for a near impossible decision or words to make. Any father would be torn over two sons or, or two children, period, arguing and at odds like that. But here we have the wisdom that only could come from a, a, a God, from God given to this father in him saying, I have to celebrate and I have to be glad because your brother was dead and, and, and eternally dead, but now he's alive again. He is lost, and now he is found. We go over to number two, skipping number one, going to number two. We see the question here, can I go to heaven without truly and faithfully loving Jesus? I think as dads, we have lots of questions. We have lots of things, and let's face it, when your kids are brought into your home, like there's no manual for it, right? There's, there's not, you know, there's no uh, dad book for dummies, uh, you know, like there was for Microsoft 9, 10, 11, 12, wherever it is uh, now, the, the explorers. There's no necessarily guidebook for what to do in this situation that this dad found himself in, which is terribly complicated and unfortunate and difficult, and yet he says the right things. We don't know or have all the answers all the time. I always make the joke to people like to have multiple kids. Like, your first kid's an experiment. You know, you, you screw them up, right? Your first one. Your second one, you're a little better and you don't, you don't mess them up quite as much as your, 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 your first one. And I say this jokingly, all right? So if this is really true in your family, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm just making a joke here. And by your third one, you, they're, you're so tired, you just let them do whatever they want and they come out great, right? Isn't that how it goes? Let me say it another way. When you have your first baby, and their pacifier comes out of the restaurant in the floor, lands on the floor, what do you do? You get a new one out of the bag, right? When you get your second child and the pacifier lands on the floor in the restaurant, what do you do? You wipe it off a little bit on your shirt and put it right back in. By your third one, the pacifier thumbs off, who knows what, you might put it in your own mouth and then put it in their mouth just to keep things peaceful. That's the kind of thing I mean. It's like by the third one, you get a little bit sore to know what you're, you're doing. So parents out there, if you have one child, don't, don't, if, if they just, if things don't turn out right with the first, just have another one, and uh, it hopefully it gets better. Although, uh, well, I was gonna say not the case with the two brothers, but it is the case with the two brothers there. So we don't always know or have all the answers. We, we kind of learn as we go. As a believer, I think that God gives uh, fathers wisdom, those who seek him. I truly believe that in making good decisions for their family. But God doesn't want us just to have good theology, the study of God and, and knowing about God. That's kind of what theology is, the study of God. He doesn't just want us to know the rules of God and the Ten Commandments and, and what you might have. He wants us to know him and love him personally. You don't want your children just to know about you. 
and the rules that you have, you want them to know you personally and you want to know them personally, intimately, lovingly, right? It's the same with our Heavenly Father, dads, that he wants to know us, not that just we know of him. Lots of people that don't believe in him know of him. He wants us to know him personally. In Matthew 16, and I use the message paraphrase here, verses 24 through 26, then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. Any good wisdom, person with wisdom would understand that we need to let God lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Turn from suffering. I'm sorry, don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? Can I go to heaven without truly and faithfully loving Jesus? I think God tells us clearly that he intends and wants and desires for us to know him in an intimate way, in a deeper way than just knowing of him. Number three, is there room for failure in our pursuit of God? (laughs) Let's hope so. (laughs) Let's hope so. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Thank goodness, I say, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What father demonstrated his compassions never fail? Luke chapter 15 the father of the prodigal son, and the father of the son who was jealous of the prodigal son. A great example of compassions that never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Is there room for failure in our pursuit of God? There absolutely is. I don't know about you, but I learn a lot from doing something the wrong way. And some of us have to learn that more than others. Some of us are a little bit more hard-headed, I guess, than others, and it takes us a few times of doing it wrong till you can do it right. Have you ever changed your own brakes before, dads? Uh, The first one you do, what happens? Well, don't say everything that happens. (laughs) What happens is, you cut your hands a little bit. What happens is you realize that you don't have all the tools that you needed and you have to go to Ace or to Advance Auto or AutoZone or one of those things. You find out that uh, in, when you have a car in Ohio, everything rusts together and becomes one single piece. You find out all these things. You find out how heavy the tire is when you take it off and then how hard it is to line it up, hold it, push it with your knee, push, get all the lugs right, and get it in back. But what happens the second time to this other side? Let's just say you're doing the front. You know what you need. You know what size wrench you need. You know how hard it's going to be and what to do and what to expect and how to get everything else and if there's a cotter pin and this and a whatever and this and a, uh, this special kind of tool or wrench that you need, you know all of that. So from experience, we learn and we understand and we grow stronger as dads. You can relate changing brakes to about anything in life with raising kids, all right? Live generously. I hope all dads hear this. Don't live um, stingy-isly. 
live generously. The rich in the kingdom of God. A few chapters back from 15, Luke 18, verses 20 through through 25. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, this is when the rich came to him asking him questions. You still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Unfortunately, when they heard this, verse 23 tells us, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. I worry about that verse quite a bit, and I've shared that with you before, and this is why I worry about that to some, well, we don't, Christians don't worry. I get concerned about this uh, verse a little bit. That was a joke, too. And we look around in the room, and we might say, boy, I wish I had their income, or we look around at somebody in town, and we say, boy, I wish I had their income. They have it pretty good. They're, they're living, they're, I always call it eating steak. Are you eating beans or are you eating steak? And if you're eating steak, in my mind, you're doing good, all right? And we think about if we had that, but if you really narrow it down to our area and our state and Youngstown, Ohio, Mahoning County and everything, there is a lot of um, need. There is a lot of incomes that are, Lower. There is a lot of things that are tougher, a lot of struggles that people are going through. I mean, if you drive into Youngstown, just look in any direction, you know. I always tell people, if you go down to the middle of Youngstown, it's, it truly is beautiful down there. There's a lot of work that's been done. Uh, my daughter's prom was down there at the, at the I think it's the Sheraton. There's just a wedding down uh, there, uh, uh, Ryan's wedding. It's beautiful, just awesome place. But if you go a mile in any direction from downtown, you got to watch out. And I think that we compare ourselves, and I might compare myself to somebody, and man, if I just wasn't in ministry, I could, you know, do this or that or have the money or whatever, and you might say something about that, or my income to some of you might be huge. I don't know. The point is, is that when you look at it from that narrow, that, just that tunnel, that narrow lens, you're missing the rest of the world. And when you throw in the rest of the world, and you throw in the income and everything of averages of the entire planet, everybody in this room is a gazillionaire. Even if you're not, by our standards here in America, you are by the world standards. You're a multi, multi gazillionaire. That's why I worry about this verse. Because it's very easy for me to say, well, I, I'm not rich, look at so and so. But I don't think this verse just talks to just us, I mean, it talks to the whole planet. And I think that we have to be very, very aware as believers of this verse. And I don't think it's necessarily wrong to have things and have toys and and things like that. I do think it's wrong when those things distract us from what God tells us to do. I do think it's wrong when we start to worship those toys or those things start to take all of our time away from the true God. I do think it's wrong when those things become our God. Well, how do we know if those things have become our God? Well, if a majority of your time goes there and a majority of your finances goes there, that might be a good indication that you've begun to worship that thing, whatever it is. We could worship stuff. We could worship all kinds of things. Anything that takes us away from what God 
has for our hearts and for our lives. Zacchaeus gave half of his money to the poor. Remember Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree and I forget the rest, uh, for the Lord he wanted to see. Jesus changed Zacchaeus' life. And after their interaction, he went from a cheat, someone who lied and take, took more than he was supposed to take, to giving half of all he had to the poor. And he pays everyone back four times what he had defrauded them. In Luke 19, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What I have begun to say to our council and what I have begun to say in our office and to our staff, to my family, when in doubt, when in doubt, err on the side of generosity. When in doubt, err on the side of generosity when you're filling out the tip line at the restaurant. When in doubt, if God lays someone on your heart to support or to give to, err on the side of generosity. I tell you something, I... <laughs> It's almost like a game, although it's not, and I don't want to belittle it like that. There's been some times, just even recently in the last two weeks, where God was speaking to my heart to give in a certain area more than typically do. <laughs> and I kid you not, I didn't even make it two hours before we had a blessing of something that was much greater than what I had been obedient with, with God. I don't say that as a, like, ooh, let's play this game where I give something and he's gonna give me more. That's, it's not, that's not how it works. It's just an obedience thing. And he sacrificed thing and a trust thing. I've heard people, we're gonna go there for just a second. I've heard people tell me personally that Jonathan, we don't give to this or that because we're just not in a place to give right now. And I understand everyone's in different places in life and has different risk tolerances. But you're also robbing God of the chance to take care of you in ways that maybe you've never experienced before. That's the point, to give when we don't always know or understand how we're gonna make it. I'm not saying to be stupid, and I had my first pastor that I served under as a youth pastor said there's a fine line between faith and stupidity. But I'm saying that more times than not, err on the side of generosity, and you will be <laughs> amazed at how things will work out for you. I can think of times, I, I know this town has been a blessing to me. I even think of my, my mom and my parents. And for the first month or two, when they moved here from, uh, or moved here from Florida, well, sort of moved, but aren't really moving, but came up here, I guess. I, I'm not sure what's going on, well, who knows. <clears throat> but for the first month, my mom would say, well, yeah, we went to Golden Eye for lunch today and somebody paid for us. We don't know who, but that happened over and over for like a month. And I know for a fact that my mom errs on the side of uh, generosity. And again, she doesn't do that so she gets free lunches at the Golden Eye. She does that as an obedient daughter of God. My point is, live generously. Live in a way that just, just, rather than stingy, live generously. Living generously doesn't mean to live unwisely. It means to be obedient to God. 
When you're at Chili's, and I know I say this a lot, because I have a heart for servers, because I get so upset with Christians and how they treat waitresses, and I've witnessed it over and over and over again, where they'll go in, and they have their nice clothes on Sunday morning after the service, and off there, I, I kid you not, I used to go home and change before we would go to a restaurant because I didn't want people to associate me with coming from church. Because I'd see people so rude and so gr- angry and so unto- intolerant and so stingy. And remember those tips that people, Christians, used to give out? It was a fake $20 bill with a verse on the back, and they'd leave those as a tip. Oh, my word, what damage those must have done. So fathers be an example of treating even the lowly with respect and grace. Maybe you got salsa instead of cheese dip when you ordered cheese dip and you got salsa. Can I just tell you something? If that's the biggest problem you have in a day, your life is really, really good. Or maybe you got burritos when you ordered uh, enchiladas. Can I just tell you something? Be graceful. Because again, if that's your biggest problem in the day, you have so much to be thankful for in your life. We all have something to be thankful for. Fathers, be that example, and I'm not saying that I do this the best. Uh, Be that example of grace. Be that example in seeking a relationship with Christ. Be that example of trying and stepping forward. Be that example to your children. So many fathers want to have this legacy and talk all about this and everything. The greatest legacy you'll ever leave is in your own household and with those that grow up with you. Yes, we want to change the world. Yes, it'd be nice to be in uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yes, it'd be nice to be in whatever have your name on a bench at the park. Yes, it'd be nice to have a building named after you. It's not about that. It's about the legacy and the instruction you leave in the hearts of those that live in the same household as you. If you've noticed around here We don't put plaques on things. We don't put names on buildings. We don't do that kind of thing. There's two reasons why. The first reason is because if you put a plaque on something and you ever want to get rid of it, it's hard as can be to get rid of it. That was my Aunt Betty's, and Aunt Betty worked hard for that. And two, it's not about our names when it comes to this place. It's about the name of Jesus Christ. So his name can be all over this place via the cross, the cross, the cross, via anything, our words via anything, because he is the one who left the ultimate legacy in the hearts of all of his children. Our takeaway this morning is this. Hope you can write this on your heart this week. Is Proverbs, the book of wisdom, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. The righteous who walks in his integrity and God's integrity, blessed are his children after him. In the end, blessed is a wonderful thing. Liz shared with us some, some meanings of blessed. You know, oftentimes in Scripture, the word blessing can be associated with in the Old Testament with more getting something, more uh, agriculture, more land. But as you move into the Beatitudes and you move into those things in the New Testament, 
you could replace blessed a lot of times with the words happy and content. Happy and content are those who trust and follow and obey. Happy and content are the righteous who walk in his integrity and blessed are his children after him. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. The ultimate father is you. The ultimate is being a child of God. So, Father, as we go from this room in a few minutes, we make a line for the donuts. As we leave this place today, help us to understand what it means to truly be a father, to truly be a man. It's not a macho thing. It's not a, always a competition thing. It's about generously and purposely and intentionally being there for those in our own household, for those in our church family, for those at our work or in the desk across from me or in the tractor across from me, God. It's about doing what you've led us to do. Help us to be happy. Help us to be joyful. When we go to the restaurant and we've had a bad day, help us to still show compassion. And God, help us to err on the side of generosity and trust you for our provision, God. Time after time after time, you've shown me and taught me that lesson. Time after time after time, you've shown so many in this room that lesson. And God, maybe you've been working on our hearts. Someone in this room, maybe that really struck or hit. Help us to have the trust to place our lives in your hands because you created us in the first place. We love you, God. We thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor mentioned the Beatitudes, and the first Beatitude is Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. But essentially, it means blessed are those who recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt and uh, that we are dependent upon the grace and mercy and forgiveness of a holy God. And so that's kind of the sentiment of this song. So, uh, you know, men, we need to be people that are vulnerable and, and have that sense of a, a broken and contrite spirit. Uh, King David said, a broken and contrite spirit you will not despise, and uh, well, he will not despise. So anyway, with that in, in mind, let's sing this song. It might be new to you. It's been around a while, um, but uh, just pick up on it. We'll start with the chorus. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, highest praises, honor and glory be unto your name. Be unto your name. We are you are forever, Lord of the ages, God before time. We are a vapor, you are eternal, love everlasting, reigning on high.
up your name this morning and we recognize that we truly are the broken but we're thankful that you are the healer amen we thank you that you are the redeemer and that you are mighty to save so father we bow before before you And we just commit to you the things that you have spoken to us about this morning. And we ask that now, Lord, you would just fill us with faith, the willingness to obey and to take action upon that. And so, Lord, we just lift you up. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you thanks in Jesus' name.